So this week we're going to be talking about hacking. Um, the term hacking covers many different activities. It's, it's kind of gained um, a wide, I guess, definition. Uh, but the definition I'm going to go with now, uh, hacking generally describes deliberate unauthorized access to spaces over which rights of ownership or access have already been established. Um, what we basically mean by this is trespass. Whenever you think of hacking, there's usually some trespass involved um, or uh, yeah, basically for criminal purposes, it's mostly deals with, with trespass. Um, hacking itself has a lot of kind of political connotations. Some groups have adopted it um, for, for the activities that they do that may even have nothing to do with computers. Um, but for this case, whenever we're talking about cybercrime and hacking, we're very generally talking about um, actions of trespass or uh, gaining access to unauthorized resources. Uh, usually some type of trespass and trespass has the goal or, um, of or access used to commit or further crime. So basically um, accessing a resource either, um, either for fun essentially to gain access to that resource or once I have access to that resource um, installing tools or stealing information or doing something else that is also a different type of, of crime. So hacking is generally getting access to things or getting control over something in, in some way. We'll talk about more what that is. So hacking is difficult um, because of various, hacking itself as a concept uh, is difficult to talk about because of the various motivations of um, groups that identify as hackers. Um, there could be very generally, we split them up into ethical hackers and unethical hackers, where here the definition is ethical hackers have a high level of specialized knowledge and a belief in the ethics of freedom of access to public information. And this is kind of a traditional, uh, more traditional um, definition of hackers um, who were just attempting to make um, basically private information publicly accessible. Um, Freedom of information is the idea behind this. Ethical hackers uh, do a lot of different things. They're commonly called penetration testers today. I'll talk a little bit about penetration testing in a second. Um, unethical hackers, however, usually create some sort of disruption through unauthorized presence um, or enter systems undetected and steal restricted information. So you have kind of two versions of unethical ha hackers. The people who want to uh, disrupt, uh, again, um, kind of uh, uh, yeah, disrupt the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of a system or data in the system um, and do it quite loudly, potentially as a form of protest or um, just because they don't necessarily care uh, if they're loud or not. And then you have groups uh, that are usually organized groups, and this is kind of borderline cyber espionage or cyber terrorism, um, that are trying to gain access to systems, do some sort of trespass without being detected to steal information or gain access to information over the long term, um, usually over the long term. So ethical hackers have the knowledge and, and skills and resources to be able to uh, access systems and potentially make profit off of it or say something political about it, but usually don't. <laughs> Even though they could, they don't. Um, unethical, unethical hackers use this power, this knowledge, um, to steal information, make money, cause damage, um, or otherwise disrupt uh, systems. Um, so I, I specifically pointed out penetration testers because they're kind of a special case. Penetration testers are hackers with the skills and knowledge um, and they uh, are hired by, usually hired by companies to search the company for vulnerabilities. They specifically look for vulnerabilities in companies. Um, that way uh, some random hacker with a malicious intent doesn't come in and find it. Uh, penetration testers, you also have ethical and unethical penetration testers where uh, ethical penetration testers will usually not um, go looking for vulnerabilities in a company and then go to the company and say, hey, look at what I found, pay me so I can fix it. Um, penetration testers that are ethical normally um, just provide consulting services and only actually do their job whenever they're asked to do the job. Um, but there's a lot of gray area there. Um, some people believe that uh, scanning systems and making sure they are secure and pointing out vulnerabilities is a service to the community. Um, organizations that normally get scanned don't necessarily agree with that statement. But um, yeah, so there are penetration testers out there. 
that are specifically work for corporations or consult for corporations to find vulnerabilities in networks. That way other cyber criminals can't. Uh, hackers must be very careful, uh, penetration testers I should say, must be very careful about um, the permission from the company to actually do a penetration test on the company and local legislation. Um, in some cases, some types of attacks uh, may not be legal even if you have permission. Now, that's relatively rare, but uh, it could happen. Penetration testers have to be quite aware um, about what they're doing. So don't just offer yourself as a penetration tester unless you understand the legal implications of doing so. Uh, penetration testers can potentially find flaws in the security of networks before malicious hackers do. The idea is to have a hacker find all of the vulnerabilities, that way you can secure them um, before anyone that has a malicious intent actually goes through and does it too. And that's essentially a big part of information security today is having penetration testers come in and look for vulnerabilities. Uh, most hack hacking methods simply abuse the trust or confusion of users. Um, a lot of what penetration testers or even hackers are doing um, is targeting not only the, the technical system, sometimes it's completely technical, but a lot of times it involves at least some user interaction or some user, um, yeah, and some users are part of their attack somehow. Um, this is described as social engineering. Whenever I'm going after a specific person to gain access to information that will give me access to the network or to information, um, we can use social engineering and it is extremely effective method of getting information about a network, about an organization, about other people. Um, and if you can do it well, uh, without even having any technical skills at all, uh, you can potentially get all of the information you need or access to entire organizations in some cases. So we can think of social engineering as people hacking. Um, here, people are the weakest link. I talked before about education, educating users about, um, for example, clicking on emails or downloading attachments and opening attachments from people you don't know. If we can attack the user and we can get the user to do some action for us, then that, inf that can potentially give us a lot of information, give us access uh, to restricted networks, restricted accounts, things like that. Uh, it's a technique to obtain access codes and information. Um, again, social engineering, I'm attacking the user. So, for example, I could just ask somebody, what's your password? And they m probably won't tell me, but they might tell me. Um, now, if I just walked into a building and said, what's your password? They would say, who are you? Get out of here. But if I go into the building and I say that I'm from IT um, and I'm here to fix your computer, I see you've had trouble logging in, can you give me your password real quick? then maybe I'm more likely to trust my IT department and I would give somebody the password. So it's basically just lying to people to get the information you need, but lying to people in a way so they don't suspect that they're being tricked. Um, there's a lot of books on social engineering and what they found is that most people are willing to help by default. So if they think that you're not a threat, um, uh, they're more likely, if you ask for help, to be willing to help you especially if you throw in information that is confusing to them and they don't want to seem like they don't know. So what social engineers or technical or hackers tend to do is throw in a lot of technical jargon, technical information that the users don't know, but it makes the hacker seem like they know what they're talking about. Then they're more likely to get information from that user to, for example, log into their computer, log into the system, and potentially even install software in the computer. Once the hacker's done that, they have potentially full access to the network. Uh, this also allows us to gather information uh, from people or documents in the organization. Another big um, uh, source of information is uh, an organization's trash or a person's trash. Uh, think about all of the things that you've thrown away. It could be credit card applications with names and numbers and things like that, uh, birthdays. Organizations throw away a lot more information and all of that goes into the trash and the trash is usually not guarded. Um, if you can get access to that information you can potentially get a lot of uh, interesting information about that organization that you can use in either other social engineering attacks or potentially even passwords and things that would allow you to log in directly. Um, for example, uh, a relatively common occurrence is that people throw away uh, phone records or phone um, 
organizational phone lists that list all of the people's names, their department, and their phone number. If I have that list, then now I can start to call around to each department and say, hey, this is Jack from a certain department. Is your computer not working well? Right? And because I've already said the department and I've said a name that that person probably recognizes, um, they're more likely to trust me and they may give me more information. They may even give me their account to log in. Um, so even things as, uh, let's say, innocuous as um, a, a telephone directory for an organization can potentially be a major hole um, that an attacker can use to take advantage of the system. Uh, other hacking methods include spyware and surveillance software. So um, installing spyware on somebody's computer, installing surveillance software to monitor basically everything they're doing, a lot of that basically just focuses on stealing information from the system. Um, and it is considered malicious software, but it's kind of a little bit separate in that it's focusing only on stealing information. It is software that collects information like passwords, documents, uh, contents of emails, contents of chats, etc., and sends it to a server or the original attacker. Uh, malicious software we'll talk about in uh, lesson 4.2, so um, I won't talk much about that, but malicious software is software that allows access or information theft, um, either access to a computer, access to a, some system, or the ability to steal information from that system. Um, another commonly used, very commonly used uh, attack now uh, is denial of service, which is DOD, or distributed denial of service, DDoS. Um, and this greatly degrades or prevents access to a system and its services. So the idea is that I can attack a system and um, prevent legitimate users from accessing that system. So if I can overload, basically, um, some, some computer, then anyone else who tries to connect to that computer or service can't because I've already overloaded the, the connection. Uh, DDoS is often used along with other methods to attempt to gain access to systems. If I can overload the system, I may be able to hack into the system at the same time. Um, and it's also very often used for political reasons. So um, for hacktivism, for example, uh, large groups of people that are activists protesting something may join their computing power together to overload a specific target. Um, whoever they're protesting, they may try to take their server offline uh, by using their collective computing power to overload that computer so nobody else can connect to their website or service. Um, it's also been used quite a bit in several different countries for election fraud. So uh, during election days, if they're using electronic voting system, uh, using DDoS attacks to shut down voting system in specific areas um, to basically try to sway votes one way or the other. So how to investigate hackers? Um, first off, we need to understand how they work. So you do need to know a little bit about how hacking works, at least how easy hacking is and how kind of the common methods that hackers go through. Um, once we understand how they work, then we can investigate a little bit easier. We'll talk about investigation in uh, the forensic section. The thing about hackers is that there's many different motivations. A lot of hackers are in it for the money, um, but some are in it for political reasons, some are in it for fun. I mean, there's lots of different reasons why people try to get into systems, access information, steal information. There are many, many different tools and approaches for hacking. Um, within the last few years, a lot of hacking tool kits have come out that make it extremely easy to do um, different types of relatively sophisticated attacks. Um, the result is that more people with a lower level of knowledge are able to do relatively sophisticated attacks against uh, real systems and cause potentially a lot of damage. Um, so you really need to learn information security basics outside. Um, I know I talked about it last uh, in the last lecture, but information security basics is one thing that you need to study on your own if you want to be a cybercrime investigator or a digital forensic investigator, and also get at least some, some introductory books on uh, basics of hacking. Understand what tools they use, what approaches they use, and some of those tools and approaches can help you during your cybercrime investigations as well. Um, obviously not the uh, tra trespassing uh, things. Uh, and one thing that I want to um, 
make very clear is that basic hacking is extremely, extremely easy. It's far too easy, actually. We've, we, we should be beyond how easy it is now, but basic hacking is surprisingly easy. Um, investigation of be beginning hackers is also very easy. So if you get into, if you start learning about hacking, really don't try to hack systems uh, that you don't have permission to access because it's, it's usually very easy to investigate beginning hackers. They make a lot of mistakes, they don't hide their tracks, and they don't know how to cover themselves up, so they're relatively easy to find. Um, hacking is easy, but making money with hacking is very, very difficult. By the time that you start to try to make money off of hacking, you will probably be caught by police. That is, whenever hackers uh, attempt to make money or attempt to transfer something of value, that's whenever the police usually get involved and that's when we catch most people. Um, like I said, if you put a computer online, it will be attacked within a matter of minutes, if not seconds. Um, people are trying to hack computers all the time and we don't really, we don't report most of them and we don't care about most of them because most of them are unsuccessful. It's whenever you're actually getting access and stealing something of value that you really get caught. So uh, don't get the idea, even though hacking is, is easy, don't think that you can do it and get away with it, basically. That's what this course is all about. Uh, so once money gets involved, the stakes increase dramatically, basically. Uh, investigators will be on you. Um, once that happens. So that's it for hacking. Next we'll talk about uh, specific types of malware and how malware is used uh, along with hacking. Thank you.